Good afternoon, everybody. I guess good afternoon. It could, could be good morning, depending where you are in the country or in the world. We're glad you're here with Resist Booksellers. I'm super excited. For those who've been following my path, I have been on this short story kick, and I have a really good uh, option for you to pick if you want to join my ride on the short story ride. Uh, we're super excited about having today's guest on the show, Shannon Sanders. Uh, Shannon Sanders, I'll give you a, a quick bio, and then we're going to get into a little bit about you. Make sure folks know who you are and then about the great book and then also the other good stuff. But Shannon Sanders is a black writer and attorney and the author of, of the linked short story collection that we'll talk about today called Company. Sanders Short Fiction was the recipient of a 2020 Penn Robert J. Dow Short Story Prize for Emerging Writers and has appeared in several publications, including One Story, Triquarterly, Joyland, Electric Literature, and elsewhere. She lives in Silver Spring, Maryland with a husband and three children. So listen, if you're here, just know that you're going to find another book to add to your TBR. I, I feel like, I feel it in my spirit, Shannon. I feel like they're going to want out and go out and get this book. So thank you very much, Shannon, for being with us today. And uh, how are you feeling? Are, are you in a good mood? You're in a good space today? Yes. Well, first of all, thank you for having me. Um, and I am really excited. This is about week three after the book came out. So I'm starting to hear from some people who have read it. I'm, I've, I've had a few chances to do events and sign books and it's all been really exciting. So for just for posterity, make sure people know the book we're talking about. The book is called Company. Uh, is. Shannon Sanders, who our wonderful guest is here. So we'll talk a little bit about the book, but we want to make sure people know who you are. They may not have uh, found you yet, but we're going to make sure they know you today. So uh, one thing I noticed about your bio, and maybe it's a small trend that I have just now caught on, maybe I'm a little slow, but I noticed you are an attorney and a writer, and I've seen that combination on multiple bios. Can you, what's, the, what's the link there? Like, why, why are attorneys moving to writing, in this case, fiction? Uh, and well, maybe better question, how would you explain your shift from going to attorney to writing? Well, if, so first of all, I would actually say it's not so much um, a shift because I do, I have a day job, I work for a financial regulator, so that is very much still a part of my um, my life right now. And I think that that's probably the case for a lot of writers because, you know, of course, there are only so many paths to making an actual living in, in writing, and many of us are doing double duty, which is definitely what I was doing. So I have always been a reader and a writer since I was a kid. Um, but I did, you know, right after college, I went to law school, started a career on that side, and then just kind of always had this real passion to write fiction and always hoped that eventually I would publish a book. Um, and so about seven years ago, around 2016 or so, I just started kind of taking writing classes and workshops just on the side, in the evenings, weekends, whenever I could sort of make time for it. And I have been juggling both of those things in some measure, I would say, since then. Um, and I don't I don't know what that trend means. I do know that right, having a legal career of any sort means you have to do a lot of reading and writing. Well, so true. True. probably there's a lot of people who where that's a strength for them. But what I kind of tend to say to people about it is... Um, I've taught some workshops and some classes now and I have people asking how do they balance, you know, if they want to have a day job, obviously, and then writing, especially one that is um, a job that requires a lot of intellectual engagement or a lot of reading and a lot of writing of it of its own is even though a legal career usually doesn't have as much of a creative aspect to it. Anything you can kind of do to strengthen that connection between your mind and, and the typing that comes out of your fingers, I think really helps the writing a lot. So because I'm doing a lot of writing that is not necessarily creative at work, I just think right. it's a little easier for my my brain to speak to my my typing fingers. <laughs> that makes sense. Uh, I think Stacey Abrams is a, is a writer. She's, yeah. she's been writing for a long time. Um, we had a guest, Jamila Minix. She's a writer. Love her. Uh, yeah. Studied law. Practicing, so I, I can see that. I mean, it's it's a good, good uh, balance between the two, right? So, um, and it's good that you don't bring all of your your work characters into the fictional space, right? I, I'm pretty yeah, sure you can't, <laughs> right. you can't do that. You can't bring all the cases inside of the books. Um, 
So listen, uh, we do want to continue this path of getting people getting to know you. You mentioned at the end of your bio that you have three children. So what's life been like on that side of your, because you said you have dual career, you have a writer, you're practicing law, but you also are a parent. Yeah. And I just, you just mentioned that you're a parent as well to small children. And so I know that, you know, that that is its own. And a one year old. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, my kids are five, two and two, and it's its own whole career. It's, you know, it's like the second shift or the third shift. It depends on what else you have doing that day. Um, and I could I could talk for hours about what it's like to try to write with little kids at home. Mm -hmm. But I, I will sum it up to say that um, what has helped a lot has been being comfortable with working in cycles. So during periods where the kids need more things or where they're not sleeping as well or when, when the, you know, when I had twins who were babies, um, I had to be focused a lot more on the parts of a writing life that were not the actual writing. So I had to be revising or submitting work to different places or trying right. to get a manuscript ready for publication when the kids are sleeping well, when they're in school, you know, when they have like kind of their own thing going on, I can pay a little bit more attention to actually trying to generate material. Um, but you just, you know, you have to use the parts of your brain that are available to you for whatever you can, you can yeah, wrangle. Yeah, fit it in. Well, yeah. that, that's how you do, that's how you do your exercise. That's how yeah. you connect with your friends, uh, parenting. And so I, I, I have high respect for you prior to coming into this conversation, but I did not know two of the children were twins. Yeah. God yeah. bless your ministry. Like, <laughs> that is hard work because the, you know, it's easy. Like for me, and of course the phone rings while I'm on the phone, uh, as a person who has a two-year gap between the two, um, give me one second. All right, if this was... Uh, broadcast television we edit that part out but we're not going to do that um so for me i have a three and a one year old so i have one in diapers and one that's potty training right so with the twins you have the same thing happening at the same time so yeah like i said uh how you're doing it I, I, my respect level is going up even higher so uh for sure um shannon sanders is the one you want to ask questions if you have questions about how to balance all of this stuff at one time so um, I do want to ask one question and you can, mm -hmm. you have the right to decline this question, uh, okay. but what's one juicy nugget about you that's not on your bio? And, and mm -hmm. that one that your, your good friends know, your, your good cousin knows that won't get you arrested, but like, what's the one thing that people know, don't know about you that maybe we can share with folks? I don't know how, I don't, I don't, there's not a lot that's really juicy, I don't think, about me. Um, I mean, I think this is probably true of a lot of writers. I am a, a, a world-class eavesdropper, and I am really interested in what's going on with other people, strangers, you know, people I, I happen to pass on the street or conversations I overhear. No, nothing sinister, nothing weird. I would never, like, invade anyone's privacy or anything like that, but I just am really a serious people watcher, I guess. So I don't so know. How is, that, is that how you get some inspiration for your writing or is that like you just do it for fun? No, for sure. I think that a lot of inspiration for writing comes from being surprised by other people and the things that they do and say, and also kind of like trying to, trying to mine whatever is that Delta, that, that difference between the things that they present and what you, what you think they actually feel. So uh, I'm really interested in how people express their feelings and how that compares with what they actually feel, which in so many cases is very different. So, yeah, I always like to. Sense. I, yeah. I've, I've seen people sitting and they seem like they're drinking a the coffee for like two hours, but mm -hmm. they're, <laughs> they're maybe yeah. they're doing what you're doing. It's like, just taking in the scene, figuring out people's lives and seeing how that works and maybe even eavesdropping, like you mentioned. Um, okay, so that's, I got that. That's not that's not going to get you arrested, right? I don't think so. Yeah, I hey, hope hey, not. No. I don't know if that's in the law now. Um, so one last thing about you specifically, uh, and just for 
hopefully we're finding you in good spirits and all that good stuff. But finish this sentence. You don't want to mess with Shannon at any point unless Shannon blank. You don't want to mess with you until at any point unless Shannon blank. Well, I guess easy answer is until I've had my coffee. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like the, the kids thing probably makes that self-explanatory. So uh, unless I've had my coffee. Um, another one might be, I thought you were going to go the opposite way. You don't want to mess with Shannon when it comes to blame. Uh, well, usually you know? when a parent is like, if you mess with my kids. Like, right. That's yeah. That's the death sentence, sure. right? That was the easy answer. I was going to say like board games, probably trivia. Oh, um, okay. I, but, I get that. Which 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 game would be the one that would get the most excitement out of you? Uh, lots of games. So my husband and I do a lot of so so like non traditional board games. So beyond like the Monopoly and all that kind right, of right. stuff, um, we we do some just different like character based art based games. But then also spades for sure. Um, yeah, my family is. Are you, are you is hearing it, ladies and gentlemen? Spades. Yeah. It keeps the family together and separates them at the same time. Like it's, it does. It does. Yes. <laughs> now, would you say you are good uh, at spades? I think I'm good. Yes, I do. Okay. Yeah. And is your is your husband your partner? Usually he is. We sometimes mix it up. It's been a while again because you know, see right. above kids. But right, right. Um, yeah, usually we're partners. Sometimes my brother and I are partners. We we might butt heads on how to bid. Um, but uh, yeah, no one makes I, major mistakes. Let's put it my, that way. My friends and I play space quite a bit and we have rules. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that we have as a mantra is that we just don't play with, we don't partner up with anyone. Yeah, right. right? Cause, <laughs> cause our reputation is in the streets now. Like yeah. we can't have that. Uh, and so I'm, look, I already know, like, again, the, the respect level for you is going higher and higher. You are a good space player. You're a good parent. You've written a good book. You're, you're an attorney. Look, all these things just adding up. Um, so let's get into your writing journey a little bit, and then we'll get yeah. straight into the book. So every every writer's journey to getting to where they are, where we're meeting you, as, as your book is out in the world, your journey to getting to this point is very different. Uh, tell us how you knew that, you know, uh, how you got your start when writing was it was real. And then, like, you know, explain your journey, how you got to this point. Okay, I think, yeah, I mentioned earlier that I was a, a big reader as a kid. So I, I think that that's probably the biggest, um, the biggest launch pad that I had was just that I used to read voraciously. I read books all the time. I used to, you know, my parents would have to take books out of my hand for me to come to the dinner table and such. Um, and then I did some just kind of, informal creative writing of my own when I was in high school and and into college too. I went to Spelman College. I took a couple of creative writing seminars um, and I had wonderful teachers there. Uh, I also did a lot of research on Toni Morrison while I was there and got really inspired by some of her novels. Um, but then, you know, I went to law school and so all of that stuff kind of was on the back burner for a long time. Um, about seven years ago, I started to take workshops. I just kind of was like, let me see, you know, what's going on with this. I know that there are other adults in the DC area who are just kind of casually interested in creative writing. And I wanted to just jump in. So I started going to the Writer Center in Bethesda, Maryland, and just taking like a weekly workshop. And I would, for each cycle of the workshop, I would have to submit a short story or a piece of fiction for people to discuss. And that really, I think, is where I got my major start, because, of course, you spend the money, the right. workshop is coming up, you want to have something to give the people that they will have something to say about to make it worth the investment. And I took that workshop probably close to five or six times over the next couple of years. Um, and I ended up with some good pieces of I ended up with some just good short stories, most of which are in the book now. And I, something, at some point I started to get this, I'm pretty competitive and I also am pretty wired the way that I feel like if there is something to be figured out, I can probably figure it out. And so I started to set my sights on how am I going to get something published in a magazine or a journal, you know, a right, literary right. magazine or a journal. 
And I just started to kind of like set my sights on different publications that I was reading that I respected. And I know, you know, from talking to writers, I'm sure you hear all the time about all the rejection that comes in the Oh journey. my goodness. You yeah. guys gotta have a strong backbone. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And and many people, understandably for many people, that's kind of where the journey ends because they mm -hmm. just, it is, it's difficult to send something out that you care about and have right. someone just summarily reject it. And I, you know, like everybody, I, I did the whole thing of just collecting rejection after rejection for a couple years. Mm -hmm. And then um, finally, one really tiny online journal accepted something that I wrote. And around the same time, I got like an honorable mention in some contest. And it was one of those ones where, you know, 50 people get honorable mentions. But those two things kind of together told me, OK, you know, keep doing this and you will eventually figure out how to make how to make something happen here. So that had me inspired to keep sending work out. And then eventually I got, you know, a few more publications. Right. Um, and then there, you know, something happened that I, I you know, for the most part, I think luck is a huge part of it. So for almost everybody, it just happens to be that the editor who's going to like your story is the one who picks up the story to review it. And in many cases, you get rejected by one editor when another would have accepted it. Um, but I, I do feel like a, another big part of it is just having sort of the perseverance to keep sending things out through the rejection. No, so there's there's two parts that I wanted to ask about. Um, and so, was was the the one time that you got picked up, or one time that somebody said, "Hey, I like this story," and maybe took took one of your stories? Is that an was that enough to kind of keep you going, or did you were you still skeptical at that point when you got the first one? That was really enough for me. I mean, I'm pretty, I'm pretty. Um, I'm pretty resilient and I do not really mind getting rejected a lot. It definitely is not fun. Right, um, right. but that one acceptance, I was like, okay, I've heard about this. I know that sometimes you get a story in a, in a magazine and then from there, maybe a better story in a better magazine. Um, and I guess I don't even really like to use the word better because every magazine has its own like imprint and there's all different audiences for everything. But, um, I had a whole lot of stuff sent out all around the same time. And I just could tell that if I continued to sort of refine the way that I focused my my submissions, that eventually I was going to get somewhere with it. And and that is kind of what happened. So I would say it, at the very beginning, I was just sending every single story to every place I could think of with not much precision and not much thought about whether it was a good fit. And accordingly, I got lots of rejections. But I did start to, you know, but I did start to think more closely about the type of story, the type of audience I think a magazine had or the type of, you know, character or personality that the magazine had. And I started to just kind of get like a slightly higher acceptance rate over time, um, simply because I was focusing my submissions more thoughtfully. And um, and then the first story that I had that actually came out that actually appeared in a magazine was in March 2019, I think. And that is the one that won that Penn Dow Prize for Emerging Writers. And that from there, I was just like, OK, I can do this. I know for sure that I have an audience somewhere. There are people who are reading these stories who like them. And I'm just going to keep going. Oh, that's perfect. Um, and, and so I, I do have a question here that came in from the audience. Are you open to those? Sure. Yeah. Right. So the question that came in says, um, how do you feel about book clubs and are you in any? I wonder if this question is from my mom. Um, <laughs> <laughs> if it's from who I think it is, I think I know him. Oh, you uh, think you do? Okay. <laughs> I think I know, but they could be a secret name. We don't have a picture on there. So, okay. Um, yes, I love book clubs. Uh, my mom has always been in more than one book club. And so I kind of grew up overhearing book club meetings downstairs in the in the living room or whatever um and my mom's book club actually was an early reader of one of my my first stories that got published and I I, I love the idea of people gathering to talk about especially fiction because I think that it speaks for itself what nonfiction can inspire discussion about you know I mean we see nonfiction books being talked about in the world all the time because they involve usually real life events or history. Right. Um, 
but I think fiction is really good for discussion too, because it can really unlock so many things about who we are, what we think, and sort of a mirror of what we what we project onto the book. Um, so I love book clubs. I am in a book club. I have several friends who have been meeting to talk about books for, I would say, like close to 15 years at this point. Wow. So yeah. Keeping keep my friend group together 15 years to do one thing is, is pretty yeah. amazing. Do you guys meet like monthly every month? Yeah, I mean, we try to be roughly monthly. Um, it's been virtual for the past couple of years. And it has been, it was really regular when we were all, again, pre-kids, most of us not married yet, most of us with a lot of free time, we would get together and and talk about books and hang out for a long time. And then now it's a lot more, everyone is kind of disparate. There's a lot more scheduling that has to be worked out. Oh, and so, sure. Yeah. We try to. I can't, I can't wait for my kids to be old enough to have their own book club, so the parents yeah. can go over here and the kids go over there. We can still have yeah. book clubs, but we we can schedule it becomes a lot easier. Uh, yeah. Before we got on camera, Shannon, and I was talking about, and all my parents, if you listen to this, the pre-parent era is very different than where you are today. And, and for those who have moved past the kids being in the home, I'm sure there's a post-children era. Mm -hmm. uh, Shannon and I have a little time before we get to that part. So <laughs> we're not even going to think about that yet. It's kind of like when you're first joining a job and talking about retirement, it seems yeah. so far away, but we're, yeah. we're going to get there eventually, Shannon. We're going to get there. So thank you for the question uh, for the audience. If anybody in the audience, if you want to ask a question, just drop it in the comments and we'll bring it on screen. Uh, so one thing you mentioned about, and this this will this will lead us right into the book, you mentioned that some of your stories that you had submitted for publication prior to this book coming out actually made it into the book, but the book is a linked story book um, yeah. and where the, the stories aren't just randomly in there. How did you make that work where you had, did you have all of these stories and they got, you know, put out some individually, but you had this book already written because the stories in the book are linked in, in one way or another. Yeah, so there are 13 stories in the book. And of those 13, at this point, um, I, well, I guess going back to when the book was first about to be published, roughly eight of them had been published in some form separately. Okay. So some of them were in print journals, some were in online journals, some were in, you know, magazines that had like an online and a print version, but maybe they were behind a paywall or whatever. And so, um, but as far as writing the stories, I wrote one of the stories and it's the very first one that appears in the book. It's called The Good Good Men um, very early on. And that was the first story that kind of involved this family who is central to the other stories. And then in my next workshop, I discovered that I had kind of questions that I wanted to explore about one of the characters from that first story. And I wanted to come at it from a slightly different angle. So I wrote another story, which ended up becoming the title story. It's called Company. Company. And um, that story is from a different point of view character and involves completely different events in history, but has a character in common with the first story. And then next time around, I kind of had that same thing happened. I wanted to keep writing about the members of this family. And it started to just kind of develop as a family tree in my mind. Um, and I continued that way through, I would say, most of the stories. There is a period in the book or in the writing of the book, I should say, where I started to have kids. My first son was born in 2018. And so some of the stories that I wrote around that time depart from those other ones a little bit. They involve other characters who are kind of outside of the family, but maybe related to them through, you know, career or whatever. And those stories kind of take up like questions of early parenthood and questions about becoming a parent and that kind of thing. Um, but I just kept finding myself drawn back to wanting to keep exploring other members of that same family tree and giving each one of them sort of a chance to be in the limelight. Yeah. And you did something in the book that helped me a lot. So <laughs> uh -huh. I, I read a lot of sci-fi and fantasy and sometimes they'll put a map in there and sometimes they'll put like the family lineage. You did the same. Yes, yeah. So for those who are going to pick up the book, you should pick up the book. Uh, there's a family kind of like tree and map inside of the book. So keep me 
keep me on the on the end where I can tell like, okay, uh, Mikhail, who Mikhail, who's Mikhail, right? You know, yeah. I can kind of kind of link those two together. Um, and so here it is, we got this connection of people and family, and the family in itself, the the, the family character can always be a fertile ground for a writer, right? There's mm -hmm. so many dynamics in the family, especially when we get past the stereotypes of what a family looks like. Uh, so what made you choose the family connection and, and, uh, as opposed to just kind of like, you know what, I got these stories that are somewhat connected, but I'm just going to kind of delve out and do something different because there's a lot of like things that make sense in your book. But what made you choose to dig into family for specifically? Yeah, I mean, I did do that too, uh, too a little bit because I have characters who are related through their workplaces or mm -hmm. or their dating Some or whatever. Yeah. yeah, but I do I do think that family is especially a multi generational family setup mm -hmm. like what's in this one. I think we really see our our value systems kind of uh, they kind of get thrown back at us in different ways when the generations interact with each other. And we really learn a lot about who we are and what matters to us when that happens. Um, and I was really interested in kind of like these other themes of like legacy and inheritance. So there is a running theme throughout the book of there being this necklace that one character has passed down to, you know, a child and then to a grandchild. And that's like a really obviously literal example of an inheritance. But I really like to see the way that uh, that other things that are less literal kind of can echo through generations. So maybe an anxiety that a grandparent has, how it plays out when her daughters inherit it, how that plays out when the grandchildren inherit it and are, you know, being raised and born into this completely new generation. Um, I also, I am one of two siblings. I have a brother and the first story in the book um, is about two brothers who are right. coming back together after kind of a separation to, um, to kind of like play out this agenda that they share from childhood. And I think all of that stuff is really interesting. I, I feel like a lot of, it often tells us a lot about who we are to see the way that plays off of our relatives. Yeah. And it was, uh, you, you jumped us right into it, especially with, uh, was it Theo and Miles? How they yeah. put it to brothers. Uh, because you introduced us to one of my, the, the character that gave me the most like thoughts and that was Lee, the, the mom. Mm -hmm. right? So, and I'm trying not to give away too much of the book. So people That's go good. buy the book, go read the book, go mm -hmm. go to the library, get it, Kindle, whatever. Come to a, a, any bookstore, like resist booksellers. Yeah. The um, the character Lee, and, and it was so easy to say, like, oh, she's crazy. Right? <laughs> uh -huh. It was so easy to kind of dismiss like her mental capacities because she was doing things that were, I'm trying to think of a good word, but like different, eccentric or whatever. Mm -hmm. But talk to me how you got to that character specifically. Was this based on someone you knew? This is some characteristics that you just kind of thought up? Because I think the interesting part is I found myself like judging my judgmentalness. Uh, that's hmm. not a word. <laughs> I was like, am I being judgmental? She's just different. Like she's not doing anything to hurt anybody. Right, mm -hmm. she's just different. I that character in a very short story, the first one, uh, just got me to to thinking more than I thought I was going to be thinking about in the first short story of the book. Where, how did you get the lead? Yeah, so she's not based on a real person that I know, um, but I did a long time ago when I was a teenager, probably overhear an anecdote that was. I just happened to overhear some friends of my parents talking about this woman that they knew whose two sons had traveled cross country to okay. deal with her, the woman's boyfriend who they didn't approve mm. of. And okay. I was, you know, I was, I was a teenager. I was kind of too young to even really have a fully formed paradigm for thinking about that. Um, I didn't have any children, you know, I had, I, no one I knew that had ever happened to or anything like that, but it just kind of stuck with me, this idea that they took it on themselves to decide that they had to go and handle their mom's love life. And I don't know how that story turned out. I don't know whether the decision that they made there was a good one, but I just was really interested in trying to explore that a little bit. So in this story, and I won't give any spoilers or anything, but um, that's what the two brothers have come together to do. 
And it's an interesting story because I always feel like it's a little bit of an inkblot test, test for the reader. Um, there are readers who, who tell me um, that they think that that's really gallant of the sons to do. They think it's like so heroic that they, that they handle it that way. And then other ones who have a little bit more of the reaction, kind of like what you just described, which is sort of second guessing, like, wait a minute, what, what am I supposed to think about this character? Right, right. That's, a, um, that's like, yeah. Shannon, stop doing this to me. It's like, a, yeah. like 15 pages in. I'm like, why am I being this way? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, and so, and I mean, I think that that's like a mark of a, of a short story that has succeeded in some way is that people, you know, they tell you in workshop that your short story is working if people stop talking about what the what the writer did and they start to think about what the characters did you know yeah. if they're if they're feeling ways about the character's behavior and almost everyone i have talked to about that story has a has a pretty strong opinion about the way that the sons in the story handle that situation so, now it, it, it could be because my my mom was never married mm -hmm. so there could be some like past experiences uh believe it or not you, you're gonna Get me with this one. The Super Nintendo. Yeah. <laughs> the Nintendo Entertainment System, whatever that was in there. I I grew up in the era of the Nintendo Entertainment System. So mm -hmm. it's kind of like, is she writing this story about me? <laughs> I, I'm having a reaction to the story. And I'm thinking, this is going to be a good ride for the rest of the book. And it was. That's great. So yeah. <laughs> uh, Company was one that I, I thought was... Um, a really strong short story in there. But again, the story stories that were in the book were different. They had a good vibe to a different feel, but I like the connection for all of them. Um, and I was going to ask about the reader feedback uh, around the stories. So what's been the feedback in general for the book? Uh, you said that some have reacted to the first story. Uh, where, what's been the, the feel for what this book represents for them? It's been really lovely to hear from readers. Um, so the book has only been out for a few weeks, but Perfect. each of the stories has been out for like that one, for example, that's been out since 2019. And so I know that there are some high school and college teachers who teach that story to kind of mm. deal with that idea of um, whether the narrator is reliable or not, whether we can trust the point of view character. And there's a couple other stories in the book that I know are, are being taught. I, I had an event with Danielle Evans a, a couple weeks ago, and she told me she's going to teach at Hopkins um, the two stories in the book that are linked because they both take place at the same party. And that is great. I love to, to think about students reading the stories and, and actually learning something from them, because that's certainly not why I wrote them, but that's just really exciting. Um, but yeah, I've heard lots of wonderful things from readers about the stories individually. And I'm still waiting to hear from people who have read the whole thing through from start to finish and have like those reactions to the ways that the stories interact with and overlap with each other. You know, um, I think that that's really exciting. I actually have heard a couple of things about that. I've seen people who are excited because they recognize the way that a character in one story kind of shows up in a different way in another story and the way right. that the point of view shifts around in that in that way um but yeah it's been I, I i love hearing from readers and of course writing is a really solitary process so you don't get to you don't really get to interact with anyone while you're actually doing it it's very much a solo thing so it's really exciting to hear what people think so now where do you stand on hearing the reader's reactions because as I, I've tapped into the reader the writer community a little bit uh -huh. that some say look I don't read any of that stuff yeah uh, send me the good ones but keep the bad ones or there's some bold ones that dig into all of them uh wh where do you stand what camp are you in I'm probably somewhere in between. I mean, this is my first book, so I have not learned my lesson yet. So I know that, <laughs> you know, um, I know that writers are, for example, not supposed to read reviews and no. I'm not supposed to be on Goodreads and, and all of that. Um, and I will stop, but I have, I have definitely refreshed Goodreads a few times just to see like, okay, has anyone else, you know, no one star so far, right? Um, so I am... I'm still a little bit of a glutton for punishment in that way. Um, I do read reviews and for the most part, they have been like really positive and lovely. Okay. Um, 
But yeah, I mean, I, I think that not every reader is for every book. I think that that's obvious. And I think that with a book like this, it seems more likely that it's not going to end up in the hands of somebody who's not interested in family drama or multi-generational, you know, linked stories. So I feel lucky that most people who are just going to completely not not vibe with it are probably not reading it all the way through. So, that's right. right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so you're a glutton for punishment. Um, you're okay <laughs> with being rejected. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, so maybe that's why, maybe that links together because uh, some people can be harsh on these yeah. reviews. They'll say uh, personal attacks is not necessarily even about the writing. And I've seen one star reviews where it had nothing to do with the book itself. Yeah. It about the actual person. They didn't like their stance on hair or something. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And it, it has nothing to do with them writing or the book. They just don't like the individual, which it's okay that you don't like the individual, but the two should should not impact one another. Yeah. Um, so let's, uh, this short story format is, is, I think it's difficult to keep yeah. starting and stopping uh, you don't have the congruence of one storyline. You're not following the path and journey of individual characters. Mm -hmm. Do you find this format easy, easier or better than if you were to try to write a full long novel? And how would that, you know, influence your decision for your next work? Is it, are you going to stay in the short story format? Are you going to do both? Or are you going to go straight to full length uh, individual novel format, for example? So I actually am working on a novel right now and I'm, I'm pretty deep into it. I'm close to the end at this point. Um, and there are, there are similarities because writing is writing, but mm -hmm. they are very different mountains to climb, I would say. Um, so with short stories, I think that I find short stories significantly, I don't want to say easier because I feel like that kind of like, yeah, that, that's, that's not the right term. I just couldn't figure out what is it easier? Is it less complex? I don't know which was the yeah. answer. I don't think it's easier because it is, you have to definitely like sustain a pace. And especially if you're going to put together a whole collection, it does take, like you said, you have to keep setting up something and then bringing it to resolution yeah. over and over. You have to do that. Um, but with a short story, you there's a couple things about it. With a short story, many of the stories in this book began where I just had like one small idea and maybe it was a scene or maybe it was like an irony or in the case of the one that we just talked about, it was like those two brothers who did that thing to their mom that time, you know, and it can be something that's very small. And then the job is to build a world around it. And you have, you know, say 5,000 words, maybe 8,000 words to do that in. So there's a lot that's challenging about doing that because you have to build something that's complete and you have a really finite space for it. Um, and again, you have to do that over and over. And you don't get to you don't get to rely on the fact that people have already seen that you can set up a scene in the previous story. You have to do right. it again, you know. Yeah. Um, that said, I think that something that makes that easier is that there is a lot more space for feedback loops with short stories. So again, writing is really solitary. It gets really lonely to write a novel because you're just literally writing pages and pages and pages. No one is seeing it. No one can tell you whether it's good or worth your time. A short story, you might spend a little bit of time on it or you know, a lot of time depending on your process. And then you can show it to someone and you can get some feedback, right, you can right. get some interaction, you know? Um, or as I did here, you can start publishing stuff. You can publish the stories individually and they begin to take on a life and to gather some feedback and that kind of thing. Um, I think that that makes short story writing easier just because, you know, the more chances we get to interact with people about our work, I think the more momentum we can get. And it's just easier to keep going when you know that it's worth your time. Um, but I do not think it's easier in general to write a bunch of short stories than it is to write one long work with one through line. I don't think that that's easier as like a, as a task by itself, you know? And, and I will, full disclosure, <laughs> they're both difficult in my mind, right? Yeah. Uh, that's yeah. why I like reading because I'm, I am actually enjoying the work, but I'm also appreciating the work that went into it. Yeah. Um, and so I, you know, even for the review thing, I take, I don't take it lightly that, this is somebody's passion that's on the page. 
Yeah. And yeah. for me to tread on it and jump and, and you know try to destroy it because I didn't like it seems unfair. Yeah. Um, I could say to someone that hey, I, I didn't really enjoy it, but here's mm -hmm. why. I didn't enjoy it because X, Y, Z. And you could listen to that and say, oh, you didn't like it because X, Y, Z. Guess what? That's my jam. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I love X, Y, Z. So guess what? Now I can read it. Um, so at least if you're going to do that, at least give a, a you know a real explanation why you didn't like it. And maybe mm -hmm. someone else could pick it up. Um, so you did kind of hint that there's a work that's in process. Are you yeah. are you allowed to talk much about it? Or you can give us a, a preview of what it's about. Sure. I mean, yeah, I can say generally what it's about, I guess. And, and then some things will probably change about it yet again before it's actually finished. But um, it actually involves one of the characters who's in company. Uh, and so, you know, part of that is because I just I really like to link stories with each other. I think that that okay. that gives you a nice launch pad. It makes it so that you don't have to start totally from scratch and you can just kind of you're off to the races. And so it involves a young woman who is kind of flailing in her personal and professional life. And she comes to understand that she has inherited a portion of a piece of family property in the greater Memphis area. Um, and are, is this- making... I'm, I'm, trying, I'm trying to pick up what character we're talking about here. Oh, I can tell you which character it is. It's a character named Aubrey who's in the book. And so in, in company, she is mostly a teenager and she's, I think actually there's one story where she is briefly um, in her early thirties and she's kind of, she's struggling in this book too, you know, okay. she's kind of, yeah, she's like the struggle bus character. So uh, in, in the novel in progress, she comes into possession of a, a portion of a piece of family property and she has to figure out how she's going to deal with that fact, considering what she has going on and the fact that she's not really equipped to receive it. So, yeah. I, and we're looking at uh, 2024, 25. We're looking at first, I have to finish it. And then, I have to <laughs> and then yeah, so. See, you, you felt the reader and me come out. It's like, yeah. hey, when can we get it? Like, <laughs> Yeah. I mean, I would say, I mean, I, I set goals for myself for sure. And I have made certain, you know, promises to my agent. And sometimes the promises get broken because little kids. Look, but, don't, don't let us readers yeah make your process any different than what it is we're gonna yeah. ask for it yesterday that's all we're gonna ask for right yeah. we love the concept can we get it now i would love for it to be ready i would love for it to be like you know actually out within a couple of years let's put it that way so right. it's got to be finished first but now, this book us, we want it to be good so yeah. whatever process right. it needs for you to make it you know a yeah. good work that's what we want so mm -hmm. i'm looking forward to it let us know um yeah. Two things. One, I'm a reader, so I want to read it. But also, I'm a bookstore, so we want to make sure yes. we keep it on our yes, shelves. Of course. Um, so uh, let's, you know, we'll wrap up here. But before we go, we want to talk a little bit about where to find you, what's next, yes. and all that good stuff. So, besides selling a million copies of Company across the world, we're going to speak mm -hmm. that into existence. Uh, what do you have coming up next that you can share? Any uh, events that you're going to be in? Any kind of conversations? Anything that you want to share with folks? Yes, for sure. Um, so over the next few weeks, I have a few things going on. Uh, this Sunday, uh, I will be at the Greedy Reads Lost Weekend Festival in Baltimore. So if you look for okay. Greedy Reads, you can find all the lineup. So there's going to be lots of local writers there. I will be in conversation on Sunday at 4.15 p.m. with Rion Amilcar Scott, who I just love. He's from my hometown. Um, he's a short story legend. And then I will be on November 3rd, I'll be at the Writer Center in Bethesda, Maryland. I mentioned that place earlier as a place where I took a lot of my early classes and several of us are going to, uh, several writers will be doing a reading there and it's kind of like a party. So I think you mentioned Jamila Minix before. She will be one of the writers in attendance there. Um, I'm excited. Jamila, to meet Jamila's you. a friend of the program. Nice oh, wonderful. Okay. Yeah. I, I've never met her in person, but I love her. Uh, I love her work and I love the like the energy she brings to the, the promo process. So I can't wait to meet her. Um, on November 29th, I will be in Converse. Actually, I think there's a, so this, the Southlands Library, and I need to look it up and make sure I'm getting the name of it right, but they will be having a book discussion of company and I'm going to be joining them virtually for that. Um, I also 
a couple weeks before that on November 9th, I'm going to be at Loyalty Bookstore in Silver Spring, Maryland, which is yeah one of my local favorites. Oh, and yeah. they're going to be doing like a happy hour, friends and family, but everyone's my friend, um, meet and greet so that I can, you know, sign some books and just kind of celebrate like the, the, the end of like the book tour era. So, yes, please come to any or all of those. Any, I mean, any I, all. Yeah. If you could do virtuals and you could do all that good stuff. But do me a favor. When you see when you meet Jamila, tell her her cousin Demetrius. Say hello. We're, okay. we're, not, we're, we're not blood cousins. We're, we're, <laughs> we're book cousins, if you would. But we love Jamila. And we love um, uh, some of the bookstores you mentioned. So for those who are listening, if there, if you ever have a chance to meet someone like Shannon, someone like Jamila, uh, in the indie bookstore spaces, please go. Yeah. Uh, there's two. There's two really good reasons. One, you get to meet some amazing people. So you get to meet the people behind the great books that you love. But also having that inside of an indie space has so many benefits to the local community. So make sure you do that. Uh, so we love loyalty. Uh, we love uh, politics and prose. I think you were there uh, not too long ago. Um, mm -hmm. We love the indie bookstores. And we, of course, we love ourselves. But um, mm -hmm. make sure you go to all of these indie bookstores in your local area. We have nothing against Barnes & Noble. But there's just so many benefits to that local community that makes so much sense to support those uh, indie bookstores. And I should um, also that the, um, the library I mentioned earlier, I had the name wrong. On, on November 29th, I will be in conversation with... Uh, a moderator at the Parklands Turner Neighborhood Library is where it Parklands is. Parklands Turner. Okay, yes. gotcha. In in Washington D.C., so that will be a virtual event. Yeah, and you got to get these uh these events in before it gets too cold up there. I know. Yeah. <laughs> before you're uh, having to trudge around in some snow, because uh, that that day is coming. Yeah. What they say uh, in the Game of Thrones, winter is coming, and it comes pretty hard and fast up in Maryland and D.C. It does. So let's, it's been an absolute pleasure. Um, where can they find you on social media? Do you have a newsletter? Any of that good stuff? Uh, so they can find me on my website at shannonsandersrights.com. So Shannon, S-H-A-N-N-O-N, Sanders, S-A-N-D-E-R-S, rights, W-R-I-T-E-S.com. Um, I'm also on, on Twitter or X, I guess, as Shanders Rights, S-H-A-N-D-E-R-S, rights. And then I'm on Instagram as I dot exaggerate. Um, so I think those are the three main places. One of these days I plan to start a sub stack, but the, that's going to have to wait probably until after the holidays. So yeah. Yeah. When, just, when you get some yeah. free time. Right, exactly. <laughs> when I can beg, borrow and steal some more time. So yes. That's right. right. Exactly. Now, like I said, um, you know, we, we appreciate you know, your effort, one, pulling this in. I know, you know, finding time to do conversation like this. Uh, so we don't take that for, uh, for granted. And we, we definitely enjoyed our conversation here. I enjoyed the book. So if you are one who loves good story writing, uh, you love a good book, you love um, being pulled in really quickly. And I, and I think that's the, the important part about short stories. You're being pulled into the story really quickly it doesn't you know they don't have many pages for each short story so they gotta get you there and they got me there really quickly with just the first story and it continued throughout the rest uh company is a really good pickup i think you'll like it uh for a number of reasons uh, but one like i said the writing too i think it's it's not it doesn't feel like all of the stories are the same even though you had some kind of link to it i feel like there was variety in there uh and if you're not into like deep trauma and oppression, maybe you'll find this enjoyable. Like it's, it's, there's some things in there that are not easy, but then I think there's some things the way she handled it, the way she presented it. It's not like a uh, trauma field book. So I think you'll love this book. Um, go pick it up. We have it at resistbooksellers.com. We have it in store. Uh, we look forward for people to come not only to read it, but also, to, I mean, buy it, but also to let us know how they think about it. Uh, so we can share and talk about I, I got to go back and read the story with Aubrey in it and, and get ready for mm -hmm. the next book that's coming. So make sure you stay uh, connected to Shannon on social media so that way you know when this book drops. Well, we're looking forward to it, Shannon. Thank you so much for being with us. And thank you, everybody who listens to this, whether it's now or uh, later. We appreciate you and uh, have a good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are.
Thank you so much for having me. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Shannon.